Welcome. Now let us today talk about space exploration or rather a brief history of space exploration. Uh, when did the story start? Well, we don't exactly know. It all started probably when the first time our ancestors looked up the sky and wondered what lies there and what lies beyond it. What exactly is the sun? What are the stars? What is a beautiful blue sky what we see every day? And that curiosity and the thirst for knowledge made us reach where we are. It changed the human race from the original cave dwellers to the 21st century man. And of course, if you see the history, there are many phases to this evolution, especially of that of space technology. First, there were the early stages when mankind observed the skies, enjoyed it, and then started using for practical purposes. Then we started deriving some correlations, some mathematical models based on the observations. Then subsequently, we started developing the required technologies. In addition to the science, the technologies were also developed. And then this technology was used for practical purposes. And when this science and technology matured, subsequently down the line, we started making real progress into the field of space science and technology. And we all know the sky at night is really an amazing sight. And apart from appreciating the beauty, early men started finding practical use for that. For example, he could find which direction the river is by following the direction of a particular star. Similarly, the way to the seashore. And you may be knowing people crossed seas reaching new continent following the location of stars. That's what we call the celestial navigation. Later, they could find, they could observe that weather changes with respect to position of heavenly bodies. For example, when the star is in a particular location in the horizon, rain happens, shine happens and so many other things do happen. So they started finding correlations. Later, apart from the stars, they identified patterns in the sky. Today we call the constellations. And this was also extensively used for navigation, then later for calendar making, etc. And all civilizations around the world, whether it's the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Chinese, and of course Indians, have used it for a variety of practical purposes to predict the flooding of rivers. The case of Nile, the Egyptians is well known for precise calendar making, predicting eclipses. This is very important. Religious purposes and of course for navigation from moving from one side to the other. So every civilization around the world started making use of this observation. And interestingly, in every timeline of history, there were people who always wanted to know more. And these people, they were just not happy with what others told. They tried to think more about that than what they saw and try to give it their own explanation, their own plausible explanation. The same question, what actually is the sun or the planets, the stars, how it functions, what is the purpose, how far it is from Earth, etc. Et of course, there was always a very simplistic answer offered by many, which is, of course, God made that way. Don't think further about it. It amounts to heresy, blasphemy, etc. etc. But there were many who were not satisfied. And some of them, as you know, paid the price for this, for this impudence with their own lives. In fact, there were so many such people, Aristotle, Aristarchus, Ptolemy, and our own Aryabhada, who lived during the 5th century AD, the Gupta period. Aryabhada made proposals on heliocentric theory, that is, Sun is the center of the solar system and all other planets revolve around it. He made accurate calculations on the duration of the day, year, and so on. His works were translated to many other languages and were studied worldwide. And it was also a time the, when the mathematics was increasingly used to interpret the observations and make predictions thereafter. Among them, the name of Nicholas Copernicus is well known. He put forward and proved using mathematics the heliocentric theory. That is a theory which says, you know, as you are all aware, the sun is the center of the solar system and all planets, including the earth, revolves around it. This is what Copernicus has put forward. Then there was Kepler, Johann Kepler, who formulated the planetary laws. It stated the relation between the sun and the planets, how the planets move around the sun. The first law of Kepler is well known. It just stated that all planets revolve around the sun in elliptical paths and sun is in one of its foci. And subsequent laws formulated what is the relation between the orbits, the size of the orbit, the time period, etc. etc. The next come Galileo Galilei, well known now, Italian astronomer and mathematician. He was the first person who looked up the sky with a telescope and he observed so many other planets and found their moon. Till that time, we all believed that Earth is the center of everything. Everything revolves around the Earth. But he found planets revolving around other planets. I'm sorry, 
uh, satellites revolving around other planets. And then based on all this observation, some of the fundamental theories of mechanics Galileo has formulated, the relation between force, momentum, etc., etc. Then appeared the great Isaac Newton, the most dominant figure in the field of physics and astronomy for the next 200 years. He practically reinvented physics, the theories of motion, the laws of gravitation. Uh, these are used even till today for computing the orbits of planets, the movements of satellite, trajectory of rockets, etc., etc. And the, the concept of the satellite itself was put forward by Newton. That is, if you give a particular mass sufficient velocity at sufficient altitude, it will keep on revolving around the Earth. So this, by the time, the, the, the mathematics and the physics had very firm scientific footing. Okay. The next phase was the development of technology. Till now, we had observation, we made mathematical predictions, we had science. But in order to implement science for practical purposes, we want technology. And the coming of age of technology happened during the second half of uh, the, 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 the two millennia what we had. And uh, the invention of gunpowder sometime in the 9th century was a landmark event. Now, some Chinese monk accidentally stumbled upon this composition of gunpowder, which is nothing but a combination of carbon, or rather charcoal, sulfur and potassium nitrate. They found that in a particular ratio, this provided a very powerful explosive mixture. So high pressure, high temperature good gases you can get. So this was used for a wide variety of purposes, including that for warfare. And when Genghis Khan, the great Mongol uh, emperor invaded China, he got the technology. When he further invaded Europe, the technology got transferred to various places on earth. And then when we make a fast forward subsequent to the subsequent centuries, so many energetic chemicals were developed both for civil and military application. We all know the case of the military applications of uh, gunpowder and rockets by our own Tipu Sultan of Mysore against the British. Okay. Now we are coming somewhere near the 19th century. There are some very interesting incidents because the, the, there was an age of enlightenment. People started thinking about uh, the development of science and technology, the power of humans in changing the world with the help of science and mathematics. This is what you call the age of enlightenment. And during this time, there were some people, especially people like Jules Verne, the French writer, they started writing books about the possible interplanetary travel, travel to the moon, etc., etc. That kindled the imagination of the general public and many children who started their, their, their education by listening and reading to these books later became great scientists who were trying to implement whatever they have learned from Jules Verne. Inspired by all, then came the pioneers. Okay, we are now in the later half of the 19th century. There is a very famous Russian school teacher. His name is well known. It's uh, Konstantin Eduardovich Tsiolkovsky. He was a simple mathematics teacher somewhere in Russia who wrote the famous rocket equation. And based on that, all the modern rockets are practically flying. Okay. And for that reason, he is called the father of modern astronautics. And he was practically a theoretician who had developed the fundamentals of astronautics, how the basic equations are uh, developed and how it is being used. But there are some people, especially the American professor Robert Hutchings Godard, who not only really studied all these things, but he made practical use of this technology. He started constructing rockets. In 1926, he actually built and flown the first liquid propellant rocket engine. And then came the World War II. And as we know, in every time when there is a war, there will be an acceleration of the development of technology. Exactly that happened in the Europe and in America, but Germans were the leaders. So they started experiment with rocket engines. They practically built the first technically modern rocket. Okay, that is what you call the V2 rocket. It had all the features of a modern rocket. It had liquid propellant engines. It had guidance, control, control of the engine. So many latest features what we find in today's rocket. And this was primarily a missile. This was built and, and launched with the military purposes. It was launched and against the Great Britain. It created a lot of damage in the British Islands. And uh, V2 was a much, much feared uh, weapon during the Second World War. And we know finally how it, all it ended up. The Germans were defeated in the Second World War. And the new superpowers in the post-World War period were the USA, that is United States of America and Soviet Union. And everyone thought Americans were the undisputed leaders in the rocket technology among the two. And as you are aware, if you know the history part of it, there was a cold war between these two countries, the Russians and Americans, and they were actually fighting for world supremacy. 
Then during the 1950s, there was a real surprise or a shock depending upon whose side you are actually on. In 1957, on October 4th to be precise, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. Why it was a great achievement? As we, as we have learned from Newton, if you want to launch an artificial satellite, you have to give them sufficient velocity, typically around 7.8 kilometers per second, and you have to launch it at sufficient altitude. And tremendous amount of energy is required to achieve it. You have to have a rocket, you have to have a multi-stage rocket, which has to be precisely controlled, accurately launched, etc. It, it calls for a variety of technology developed. So when Soviet Union has launched the satellite, it, it has very clearly proven that they have the capability in all these directions. And then this was a shock because there are potential applications. For example, when a country can launch a satellite to space, it can literally drop a weapon anywhere in the world. Okay. So the Russians saw the cross the first milestone and then the Americans were trying to catch up. So this is what we call the space race. Okay, there were leaders on both sides, on the Russian side as well as in the American side. The same Dr. Werner von Braun, who developed the V-2 rockets for the Germans, was now working for the Americans. And there was Sergei Pavlovich Korolev in the Russian side. The, among, with the leaders in the forefront, there was a space race between the Americans and Russians. And the Russians won the first part. We all know they sent the first man, Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, in 1961, April 12th. And of course, it was followed by the first woman, the first spacewalk, first multi-crew space, uh, spacecraft, the interplanetary props, the props to the moon, taking photographs on the other side of the lunar uh, area. So the American, the Russians were uh, winning the first part. The Americans caught up, tremendous amount of resources were put in, huge rockets were built, and the Americans won the second round with the man landing on the moon in 1969. And we all know who are all the people. It is led by Neil Armstrong, Edwin Alton, and then uh, Michael Collins, who was orbiting around the moon. The, the race was not over. The Russians again took further lead in human space flight, space stations in the 70s. The Americans again came with the space shuttle. So it was something like a ping pong a game between the Americans and Russians as far as the space technology is concerned. And this race continued till the 90s when the Soviet Union politically disintegrated. Okay, then in that process, in that race, so many other things also happened. There were development of satellites for remote sensing and communication. These are two pillars of uh, the applications of space technology. What exactly is remote sensing? Remote sensing means you are just trying to take a photograph of the earth from a remote location. So a lot of information can be covered in a single snap. Similarly, development of communication systems means you can actually send a signal from one side of the earth to the other side through a satellite. Okay, so these two are two pillars of the space application. And now increasingly, a new player has come into the foray that is the navigation system. So you can find out where you are basically using the system of satellites. So all those fundamental technologies were developed in the 60s and 70s by the Americans and Russians. And in the 90s, as I told, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was collaboration between these countries and they all cooperated to each other in achieving new uh, technological feats. And the 70s and 80s, so some, some new developments also. There are so many emerging superpowers, including India, China, Japan, and many European countries. And now if you come to the 21st century, apart from the government agency, there are so many private players taking the lead role because there are so many, uh, uh, so many individuals, private parties who had enough money to put it in uh, the space technology. And they were developing a uh, lot of new technology for human space flight as well, including commercial space travel. That means if you give money, they will take you to space. Okay, now let us briefly talk about our own space program. As we discussed earlier, the Sputnik has literally shaken the world and many great scientists in India got inspired by it. And as you know, we had just gained independence. There are so many brilliant young scientists who completed their studies in different parts of the world and they were very much eager to work for the country. And they all came back to India and they were all trying to do this national building for the newly developed India, newly independent India. And the zeal of pioneers like Homi Jahangir Bhabha, Vikram Ambalal Sarabhai, when it combined with the scientific temper and vision of the then Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, it created the right environment. And that initiated the Indian space program. And as I've discussed, inspired by the global events, our government then constituted the Indian National Committee for Space Research, generally abbreviated as INCOSPAR in 1962, 
under Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Practically, we can say this is the, the seeding of the Indian space program. And Incospar took the decision to set up the Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station, what we call TURLS in Tumba, in the southern tip of India. And here, the scientists from the entire world came. And it was Dr. Sarabhai believed that science in science there are no boundaries either political or ideological, everyone has got right to access information and knowledge. So in November 21st, 1963, is a, indeed a memorable day for India, for Indian space program, when a US supplied Nike Apache rocket took to the skies from Thumba. So this was again a major landmark and the turtles was dedicated to UN in 1968. Uh, because you know when it is in the uh, at least under the ages of even any anybody in the world whether the russians or the americans or the french or the british they can all come and work probably this is the only area where both the americans and russians came and worked together and isro the indian space research organization was formed in 1969 and then one important point there are many people who questioned the relevance of space programs for india then but dr sarabhai was very clear and he had no doubt regarding the same he very famously said we are convinced that if you are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the committee of nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society. This is the real difference of Indian space program. Many other countries in the world pursued the space program just to show that their systems are better, their political systems are better, their economic systems are better. Whereas India, we genuinely wanted to improve the quality of life for our own citizens. Vikram Sarabhai envisaged with the advent of space technology, with the practical use of space technology, each and every citizen will have equal access to the nation building process. He will benefit equally from the development of the country. So this was what he had in mind. But unfortunately, Vikram Sarabhai passed away in 1971, but ISRO was very fortunate to have a great scientist engineer to lead it subsequently. It was Dr. Sadish Dhawan. He steered ISRO through the initial period. And then in 1975, another major achievement. India could make a satellite in Indian soil. But at that time, unfortunately, we did not have the launch vehicle capability to launch a satellite. So it was launched from USSR, the Soviet Union. And as I mentioned earlier, the satellite was named Aryabhata, the great Indian astronomer who lived during the 5th century. Okay. Then we wanted to make our own launch vehicles. A satellite launch vehicle program was set up. In the 70s, it was called SLV-3 and we all know who led the program. It was none other than Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And in 1980, the first successful launch of SLV-3 took place and India became one of the very few nations who could build a satellite and launch a satellite with its own capability from its own soil. And then India started developing the satellite. Because this Dr. Sarabhai's vision was like that only. You know? We had to make satellite, we had to make launch vehicle, we had to be self-reliant, we had to be of use to the nation. We started developing satellites. As I mentioned earlier, we made satellites for remote sensing, for taking photographs of the country. We started making communication satellites for uh, information exchange. So we had two programs, the IRS program, Indian Remote Sensing Satellite Program for remote sensing, and we had the INSAT program for communication. A major achievement in the 1980s, was the development of Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle or PSLV. And by the 90s, we had operationalized the PSLV. That means the PSLV is fully capable of taking commercial launches. So this was a major achievement and PSLV is a world-class vehicle. It's a workhorse of Indian space program today. And the success of PSLV really cemented India's position in the world as a real space power. And apart from this technology, apart from the, the regular activities of benefiting the with the fellow citizens of our country, we started developing things further. We started pushing the envelope further. We had SRE-1, that is the satellite recovery experiment, where for the first time, we recovered something back from space. Then we had the much uh, celebrated EduSat, where a satellite was used for the sole purpose of disseminating education across the country. Parallelly, we were developing cryogenic technology. Uh, that is, you know, a very high efficient engine by which the payload capability, the rockets can be improved. This way we are doing it parallelly. Ultimately, we became successful with the uh, GSLV uh, Mark II vehicle later. And of course, there were Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan. Because Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan were programs of exploratory nature. It is for the understanding of our neighbors. Okay, when we have programs like that, it really further pushes the envelope of our own capabilities. It really provides challenges to our own generation. It really provides challenges to the entire ISRO community. And we know 
the chandrayaan and mangalyaan were huge successes because for the first time we have achieved we have achieved, we have attempted that and the first time we were successful and uh, and as our own prime minister has mentioned who else can make a interplanetary probe with the cost less than that of a average hollywood movie so this was this are all great achievements and then there are a lot of future activities as well for example india today makes or attempts to make launch vehicles and satellite which is on par with the international standard but there are new demands and requirements there are requirements for cost effective launch vehicles so we are making vehicles like sslv small satellite launch vehicles and on the other side we want to further pursue the development of science and technology so we are having programs like human space flight program and today the entire world acknowledges the indian space program for achieving so much with so little okay that space program from its inspection inception had a role of benefiting the fellow citizens of india and to a great extent we have been successful and today the indian space program is embarking new avenues far greater than what our founding fathers have envisaged and hopefully many of the young colleagues who are listening to this can be a part of it in the days to come as you know the nation has consistently put its trust in isro and we here in isro believe that we could repay at least a fair part of it in terms of achievements and making our nations proud thank you for your valuable time jai hind